EOC, so if there's any confusion there, I apologize. Um, I'm going to be talking about the anatomy of denial of service and distributed denial of service testing um, that I was able to do as part of a contract uh, associated with uh, a large ISP uh, in the western area. <laughs> I won't mention their name. Okay, this is not an advertisement, this is not an endorsement, and this is not a claim that I know how to program anything that's remotely related to denial of service or to distributed denial of service products. Um, as we get into it, you'll see how we got our hands on the actual tools that we use, uh, but I'm not a programmer, so. Some of you may have programmed the ones we used, we will, shall see. <laughs> Um, why did we test, methodology we use, the challenges and lessons learned, and the findings uh, associated with those. Why? We needed a product to protect our infrastructure, the data, and business continuity. Um, another reason it was uh, the testing occurred was because uh, they had just gotten beaten up by several denial of service attacks uh, recently, so they decided to finally think about something to do about that. Um, part of what we need to do is evaluate emerging technologies. There's, you know, tra traditional protection of denial of service is limited, so we had to look at what new technologies were going to be out there, and we'll hit what those are. So this is ultimately going to end up being a review of the products that we tested. Um, the other reason why the problem is getting worse uh, there's uh, quite a few tools that people can get their hands on very easily uh, once they learn how to uh, acquire zombies and start uh, distributing the, the tools they can uh, quickly bring down sites wet, either websites or just deny service across uh, networks okay nice pictures uh, again the problem is getting worse let's see denial of service 39% uh, of the people polled had detected or determined they had denial of service attacks. The system availability or system unavailability is the uh, fourth largest area of concern that uh, this particular survey had identified. And the second most important project was the security and availability of websites. Uh, again, availability being uh, the opposite of denial of service I guess <clears throat> what were we looking for we had to find solutions that were going to work in the infrastructure something that's going to be able to um, work within gigabyte solutions uh, both giggy and multi-mode fiber we also ultimately needed to find solutions that were going to scale to the OC 48 to OC 192 levels uh, they're not there yet but again hoping they will scale we also needed something that would uh, ultimately work toward protecting the customer. Uh, again, looking at the, the gigabit levels, uh, fiber and gig E. Uh, 10 100, which is the most common customer side at this particular ISP, and then eventually being able to roll out to OC48 and OC 192 levels. Here's a list of the products we tested. Um, I got permission from most of them to talk about them, so we should be in good shape. Uh, on the passive tap solution side, uh, let me explain that for just a quick second. It, we looked at two sides. One would be something that was in line uh, that can, you know, hopefully implement a uh, protection against denial of service as soon as it's detected. The other was something that we called passive tap, for lack of better names, which was supposed to be hidden on the network um, with no network side IP addresses that uh, would be detecting receiving information. Uh, so within that area, the passive task solutions, we had Arbor Networks, Reactive Networks, Mazu Networks, and Asta Networks. The inline solution side, we did Captus Networks and Mazu Networks. They actually had two products in the test. I did want to point out that each of these vendors was extremely supportive throughout the testing process. Of course, they want to sell product, but they're also utilizing these uh, 
head-to-head -head tests as you know development for their products they get lots of feedback they get information that's useful to them to help develop their products the methodology we use um, now basically there's just a few things you can do for uh, denial of service pr prevention today uh, reverse path filtering is is one item um, ingress filtering egress filtering uh, broad, protect or stopping directed broadcast data and uh, basically unplugging your computer unplugging your network and going back to pen and paper um, I tried that I can't find any pen or paper so we're gonna have to look at something different we needed to imitate a customer hosting center um, this involves setting up a network lab which we'll see a diagram here shortly that would uh, basically have similar equipment that would be in the hosting center. We needed to run real-world tests, products that are easily available um, out there. So we, we found you know, the different tools from that aspect. We needed to test both the network functionality side of the products and also the management side of the products. And we needed to find solutions that are going to work farther upstream in the network, not all the way down to the customer, but preferably up uh, closer to where the uh, the data is coming into the ISP itself to help stop some of the, the stuff where it can still be controlled, where the bandwidth is a little bit higher. This is uh, a basic snapshot of what our test environment looked like, um, where it says attack network, which I guess for you is on this side. Uh, there were several attack boxes that were set up that had the various tools that we needed to do the uh, denial of service attacks and on the far side the victim network side we had three to four victim computers that ultimately were used or were the targets that we were using um, we had a combination of Cisco and Juniper products in that which was fairly common for the ISP itself uh, and also a combination of uh, gigabyte or GSRs on the Cisco side where we had the multi-mode fiber as well as uh, 10 100 Ethernet connectivity um, let's see the two Cisco 6500s or which are 6509s on either side of a large GSR were actually used for port mirroring um, we were trying to test multiple products at one time and to do that we had to have port mirroring to get the data flowing through Okay, on the passive tap uh, testing side, we had no network side IP addresses. That was the desire. Uh, that was not always the case, depending on the product. Uh, data mirroring so that all they were getting was the pass-through data. That it was not two-way stateful communication. Um, desire was that these products not be a single point of failure in the network. If you have an inline device, um, certainly without high availability, you have the issue of it becoming a a single point of failure in the network. Um, they also looked at the products because they offered multiple levels of providing protection. Um, in this case, all of them were basically recommending ACLs back to the routers themselves as to what kind of traffic, what IP addresses, what IP ranges they were going to block. Um, they semi -auto or automatic, semi-automatic, or just basically a flag or a, an alarm to let you know that there was an issue. Yes. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. The you I I still couldn't hear you. You say in GSRs do not do ACLs? The Okay, we, we weren't trying to do ACLs on that particular box. We were looking at the, basically the ingress side and the egress side, not the center. So, but thank you. <laughs> um, we were ultimately looking at ACLs in the Junipers and the 6500s is where, where they would be end up. Okay, the configuration for the reactive network solutions um, the reactive solution had two boxes associated with their solution. 
the detector and the actuator. The detector set farther downstream, closer to the customer. It did data profiling, traffic profiling, um, alarms. Uh, it communicates with multiple actuators, which would be farther up in the stream. And together, and this is where their smoke and mirrors magic works out, together, they work together to provide the recommendation for the filter um, that would be implemented. Um, in this particular case, the actuator had to have a connection, an SNMP connection into the network in order to, uh, to help track the data and also that's how it would implement the filter into the network itself. Now, Mazu, they had a single box called the inspector. Um, they basically, trying to think how to say this, they basically took inline and pushed it out passive. It was a unique solution. They had ha basically, um, it wasn't duplex communication over a fiber line. It was only the in inside was coming into their box. Uh, they, in this particular release, and of course things change over time, but in this particular release, they only recommended the filter. They did not do any actual implementation of the filters into the uh, routers themselves. They just created the alarm um, and told you what they recommended putting in. You had to physically put that in. Uh, they did have a real nice traffic pro profiling mechanism in their product that we actually used quite a bit during the testing for all the products because it gave us a good idea of the breakout of UDP, uh, ICMP, and TCP traffic that was occurring. Okay, Asta Networks, they uh, were composed of two boxes. Um, one was purely a management box that took input from all the collectors. Uh, we only had one to test, but you can have multiple collectors in your network. Um, this one worked off of NetFlow and CFlow-D. It got its information from there instead of direct traffic uh, feeding. So we had to go through and set up NetFlow and CFlow-D, NetFlow being on the Cisco side, CFlow-D being on the Juniper side. Um, that, that worked in some cases, did not work in others. Uh, you, depending on the versions of Cisco products, Juniper products you have, it's going to be uh, resource intensive potentially to implement NetFlow and CFlow-D. If you have the latest and greatest, those do it a whole lot better. Arbor Networks, um, they actually gave us five boxes for our test. Um, that worked out really well. They had a combination of uh, both packet analysis as well as NetFlow and CFlow-D analysis. Um, that gave us a, a larger picture. And of course, they had a controller involved with theirs as a management device, all intercommunicating between each other, providing uh, each box data as to the value or where, as to what is actually going on in the network and um, when you exceeded certain thresholds or when you went out of bounds of what it knew as normal traffic, then it, it alarmed you, recommend, made recommendations. You could either automatically implement them or you could uh, manually implement them in the process. <coughs> okay, on the inline testing side, um, based obviously inline, box, <coughs> boxes are placed in the data stream itself. Um, with that being the case, there's always the concern about single point of failure. A couple or at least the Captus product had a high availability solution. The uh, Mazu product was probably not quite as mature at that time and did not have uh, a high availability solution available. Um, the, the general idea of the inline product is it's going to be quicker in response. It's going to um, recognize it, and if you have it set up right, it's going to be able to push out the, uh, the protection against the denial of service in, you know, immediately. And in this case, you had to have the interfaces visible on the network. They had to have IP addresses, so that alone made it a little bit of a vulnerability in there. Uh, for the particular case of the ISP I was working with, 
they were very much against an inline solution because they did not want to lose control. They did not like the, uh, the ability of the product to automatically implement something into the network. They wanted to have manual review before something was implemented. And it would take um, quite a bit of time for them to get comfortable with a product before they would ever let something like that be implemented. And I saw a couple of head shaking that that's probably the case in a lot of places. Um, but if you think about it, you know, uh, firewalls are inline solutions. Um, IDSs can be inline solutions, so you may you may already have that issue of uh, availability. Okay, the inline solution side. Okay, the the Mazu box was placed um, after the GSR, but before the Cisco 6509, uh, before the victim network. And that was where they recommended we put it since we were doing the testing. We said, okay, we'll put it there. Again, this box did the decent traffic pro profiling that I mentioned for the other Mazu in the, in, uh, in the passive testing. And uh, it, you know, it gave some good representation of the data. And then it all came down to how the box performed in the testing itself. And then Captus, um, Captus was designed to be like a firewall. As a matter of fact, Captus is an integrated firewall DDoS or DOS uh, mitigation solution. Um, they do a lot of their initial filtering with the firewall portion of it before they implement the actual uh, DDoS protection. Um, the, the thing we found about the Captus is it's very uh, quote unquote programmable if you, once you learn their code, uh, it has a lot of flexibility because it, it, it actually has no GUI. It's uh, all command line and it brings it up. Uh, you can define quite a bit of information into as to what you want to watch for or what you want to do with it when you find it, et cetera. Some of the tests that we run, um, first thing we had to do was come up with some baseline traffic. We had to have something to simulate something. You know, we had to have something to simulate a, a baseline network that we were working with. A lot of these products require, quote unquote, burn-in time of data so that they baseline their traffic so they understand what normal traffic is so that when you go out of the bounds of that normal traffic, you get an alarm or you get something that says, that, hey, something's not normal, you need to look into it. Um, so we had to actually burn in like 72 hours of generated traffic and keep that running throughout the entire test. Then we implemented the attacks that we did. Um, we did a combination of several attacks, and we'll hit the tools we use here in just a second. We, uh, you know, TCP sends, TCP acts, uh, floods, fragmented packets, <laughs> fragmented packets, uh, IGMP floods, um, spoofed, and we, we did this in a spoofed and unspoofed manner. Just trying to see how the products are going to react. And we also did it on both the, uh, the regular network side and the management side. Uh, sometimes they forget about the management side. Some of the lessons learned. On the network side, uh, <laughs> when you're creating your baseline traffic, you got to make sure that it's got the full communication three-way handshake because the products don't like it if they don't see all three of them. Um, it took us a little while to figure this out. Yeah, it seems like a no-brainer now, but at the time we thought we were in good shape. Um, but anyways, I wonder what in the heck that is. <clears throat> and the other thing about the network, if, yeah, if you're in a lab environment, and don't do this at home, do it in a lab. If you're in a lab environment, if you can control the lab, you're going to be in a lot better shape. It took us six weeks to build the lab because we didn't have control of the lab resources. Um, and that's a long time to build a test network. Uh, but in the meantime, we learned a lot about it. So the education process was pretty cool. Okay, what happens if you have bad routes and you run a denial of service attack? <laughs> you kill yourself. Um, and we just, uh, as they were trying to upload the uh, stuff from the, the war driving contest just out here a little bit ago, uh, they had some route issues. Uh, actually, somebody was, uh, they thought they had two default routes. It looked like they had two, two default routes. Uh, so you. 
anytime you have route issues, uh, you uh, run the potential of uh, running the denial of service attack against yourself um, or bringing down the entire lab network. <laughs> we did that. Um, the lab we were using was, part of it was ours to use, obviously, but part of it was also other uh, ongoing uh, lab tests, and so the other people weren't quite happy about that. But we did prove that the tools work, and they work very well. Um, part of what these products also desire, require, is a separate management network. Um, as part of that, make sure that you have the right separation on your management network within your routes versus your actual live network uh, for the same reason. You're going you're gonna to bring down your lab. Okay, our attack network, um, we did our best to scrounge as much equipment as we could. Um, I did need to mention this, this testing, other than my services as a consultant, was done with no other costs. We couldn't go out and buy equipment, with the exception we did have to buy uh, some gig uh, fiber cards. Uh, so we, they gave us uh, a thousand bucks total to conduct this testing. Uh, but at any rate, we, we used Linux 6.2 and Linux 7.2 boxes, um, running open bo uh, an open BSD box and a Solaris box, so the four attack boxes we were able to acquire uh, throughout the process. And this had a mix of 10100 and gig interfaces on it. Uh, we wanted to use the gig interfaces to get the traffic levels as high as we possibly could. We wanted to. Uh, we wanted to exceed what the normal network would see. Otherwise, you know, it's, you don't really have a good test. You don't see what the products can take um, in the testing process. Uh, some of the tools utilized. Uh, one of the vendors had a testing box, a box that had all kinds of attacks on it. Um, we originally were not planning to use that because uh, we didn't want any preferential treatment toward a particular vendor, but we found the box to be very useful, um, and so we did use that quite a bit, and it, it gave us things that we didn't have easily available otherwise, like IGMP attacks, um, as well as uh, some others. Uh, open source, uh, we use Stream and Lightstorm and Fscript and RC8 and Slice 3. Uh, we particularly found some of them very useful. Uh, stream, let's see, that was one of them that brought down the entire net, the lab network. Um, fragmented packets, which we were able to use it out of the uh, traffic generator from Arbor, that brought down two of the four management interfaces. Um, so we, we found some tools that we liked that really gave us a, a decent test of the product. The victim networks we tried to set up with uh, some monitoring tools. Uh, we did try to set up La Brea on four different victim boxes. We couldn't quite get it right, so we never did quite use it, use it but we did use Snort and um, a couple other tools that we had in our tool bag to see what was going on on the victim computers. And then we did quite a few manual checks while the testing was going on. Uh, simple pings just to make sure we were still talking across the network, just running, you know, running it straight forward. And also uh, CPU utilization statistics on the top on the systems and, and seeing what was running. Uh, the victim network uh, was composed primarily of Linux 6.2 and Linux 7.2 computers. Okay, we talked just briefly about NetFlow and CFlow-D. Um, when you're setting that up, the, the sample rates you're using have to match inside the products and inside the routers that you're getting that information from. We found also that the Cisco 6500 or 6509s uh, do not create usable uh, NetFlow data for the purposes of the products. Uh, we did uh, get decent NetFlow data out of the, uh, the GSR and the Junipers uh, did quite well as well. And the Junipers actually were more consistent and more useful data. Uh, this is not a sales pitch. Let's see. Now the flow sampling gave us several different things. Uh, one was traffic characterization. 
uh, in, a, you know, in a sample format. The products themselves use that data to determine what the traffic patterns are and what the changes in the traffic patterns are. Um, flow sampling can also be used for things like customer billing, uh, again, for the same reason, where you're getting the traffic patterns, utilization, and it can be broken down by, uh, by IP or IP ranges. And certainly, you know, it can be used for DOS and DDoS detection. SNMP um, is used by the products themselves to communicate with the routers. Uh, you had to have a connection available for those that were going to try to implement automatic routes uh, into the uh, or automatic ACLs into the uh, routers themselves. Um, we had. We had a couple of situations where they didn't tell us we needed this and we couldn't get the products to work and they finally told us, oh, what about the SNMP connection? Um, the other thing, uh, we were conducting SNMP testing. I wasn't particularly, but the group uh, we were working with the lab simultaneously with this, uh, with the same routers. So we had some situations where we had to stop our testing because the SNMP uh, tests had brought the systems down. Uh, basically running the the, uh, the warning about SNMP public had come out about that same time so we were running testing about the same time so certainly if you're setting up your community streams don't set them up as public you're not supposed to do that what do the vendors do well they monitored the baseline traffic pretty well uh, they detected changes in the traffic patterns pretty well uh, the some of the products you just had set up a you know a pure level that if exceeded that level it gave you a warning some of the products learned the data and told you if it changed over time um, they did that fairly well that's what they were programmed as designed to do uh, and these generally were initial releases that had come out uh, but they they did that part pretty well and it did alerting and alarming when the thresholds and, and statistics were exceeded. What they didn't do too good was uh, protection of the management interfaces. They hadn't quite gotten to the point where they put a lot of thought into um, protecting the management side from denial of service attacks. Uh, we were able to attack the management ports and bring and lock the boxes up and uh, you know, then they become useless if you're able to get in on the management side. I say this generically. The couple of the products did very well in this test. They survived. I'll put it that way. They the uh, they either recovered quickly or they just had a little bit of degradation of service. Some of them just completely locked up. They hadn't thought about warning banners and lockouts and that kind of thing for the uh, for the management interfaces yet. Uh, again, that they took those suggestions and and promised that those would be all things that were added to their next uh, next release of the product. Port lockdown on the management interfaces. Uh, you know, having as few ports open as possible uh, helps to prevent additional denial of service attacks from happening to your product. Okay, if you're looking at a, uh, a large enterprise, uh, the products that you'd want to look at, again, th this data is at least four months old. Uh, unfortunately, uh, DEF CON only occurs once a year, so uh, the data can be a little dated. There's new releases out on all these, and I recommend if you have any interest in learning in these products at all, go to their websites uh, and get some information. Uh, you'll have my contact information, and I could probably link you up with one of their salespeople because they all call me all the time. <clears throat> but um, basically, if you're looking for a passive solution, uh, for the large enterprise, we recommend the passive solution. Again, every most of them we talk to do not want automatic uh, routes, or, or I'm sorry, automatic ACLs implemented, that kind of thing. Um, these solutions can be very expensive depending on the number of boxes that you ultimately want to end up. We, uh, we priced out for this particular ISP that the solution was going to be in the range of 10 to $12 million for DDoS to protect their entire network. Well, that's probably a bit high, but it can be scaled down from there. 
Anyway, so you would have, on the large enterprise side, you'd have a mix of uh, flow collectors and packet collectors. Uh, again, the flow collectors are the net flow collectors, the ones that get the, the uh, data, the net flow, C flow D off of the, uh, the routers. Packet collectors are one that process all packets that flow through it. Um, those would be in your network, visualize in your network. You'd have to um, centralize the management consoles. You're looking at uh, whether it be in your NOC or your security operations center, you'd be centralizing that uh, management piece uh, in there. Most of them could handle approximately 10 of the collector boxes per management console. So again, it depends on the scalability that you have to look at as to how many boxes or how many uh, management boxes you would need in your network. But the products in this space are the Arbor, the ASTA, and the Reactive. Um, the, our particular test, the, the one that quote unquote won, was also the most expensive solution, was also the most mature solution, um, and was also the one that had the most products in that solution, uh, was Arbor Networks. Um, they had performed well in most of the testing uh, with some minor things. Uh, but again, Arbor, Asta, and Reactive were all very supportive and they want to sell you product. On the smaller enterprise side, uh, we're looking at uh, the inline solutions are worth considering. Uh, they can provide value. The uh, combination firewall and DDoS solution, or DOS solution, um, and combination IDS and DOS solution ultimately, I think, will be uh, the most useful part of it. Uh, Captus, uh, they're very programmable, uh, like I mentioned before. They uh, had also put quite a bit of thought in protecting the management uh, side of the product and uh, performed fairly well. They, their processing and storage is going to improve, this is what I've been told, improve with the, uh, the new releases that are coming forward and with the new releases, they hope to be able to handle greater than 10, 100 networks uh, up into the gig. The product we tested, uh, gig interfaces brought it, uh, or gig type speeds brought it to its knees. But the, uh, from a 10, 100 perspective, they did perform very well. Um, and Mazu, uh, maturing product, they did uh, well in some aspects, not so well in some others. Uh, again, everybody's improving their product as they go around. The technology is still evolving. It's, uh, it's something that ultimately, I believe, is going to become integrated into firewalls and or uh, IDS solutions and have already started to do that. It, it's definitely something that, that is needed and you, you know we see acquisitions all the time and I think you'll start to see these companies acquired by other companies to develop the suite of products, my opinion only. Um, but they've made positive strides uh, in the DDoS environment. The products themselves mostly do what they advertise or what they've tried to, to advertise that they do um, with with minor exceptions, uh, it's involving, it's, uh, it's interesting, it's new, uh, keep an eye on it. Um, the Information Security Magazine did an article on this that uh, back in, uh, I think it was October of 2001, that was actually the driver for selecting the uh, products that we tested. And uh, I'm sure that the, the Security Magazines will keep an eye on these products for those that survive through their next round of venture capital funding. Um, as viable products. But here's some resources. Uh, basically, you know, they, do a search on the web, you'll find all kinds of stuff. But uh, here's some places where I found some information on DDoS, um, as well as all the product vendor websites. And that's pretty much it. That's, uh, that's the testing we did. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them and go from there. No, we did not try spade in context of that. Um, we knew there were some limitations on the testing that, that we were doing and we got 
stuck with time constraints as well. So that, that would have been a good addition. So. Okay, speeds of solutions, I do not have hard numbers on per se. Um, I, in terms of surviving the attacks, um, the passive solutions, the Arbor, the Asta, uh, Mazu, hold on. Yeah, uh, we're Asta and Reactive. Um, the speeds, we got, uh, we had three of the boxes going at gig E speeds pushing data through it. Um, Arbor and Asta both processed them fine. Reactive, for the most part, processed them fine. So it, it they survived that portion of it. Um, in terms of costs, it, the costs have changed since we did this testing. Some have gone up, some have gone down. Um, and it depends on which pieces you buy. Uh, the, like I said, the Arbor solution was fairly expensive. Um, it, but it was also the most mature. The reactive, uh, I believe reactive has now gone to a model where you basically lease the license and you pay on a monthly fee. Uh, Arbor, you were buying the boxes and that kind of thing. So they, to give you a hard answer now, it would be difficult without doing more research where they stand today. Uh, but uh, the Arbor solution I know was very expensive for the whole shebang that we had to do. But uh, yeah, it just varied on what you need to provide. The trap is the Arbor Traffic Gen available as a standalone product? Uh, the answer, at least when we checked into it, was yes, it is. Um, the price quote on that, again, old data was sixty-two thousand dollars. It was a good product. Um, the question is, the, Cis the Cisco AC routers are known to roll over with too many ACLs on them and die. Um, the answer is yes, they did roll over on us, especially when we were combining SNMP testing at the same time. Um, we did not implement that many ACLs. We were actually looking just at what the recommendations were versus actually implementing the ACLs. We did go into detailed uh, discussions about what would it take to do this in their environment, which would in, have involved upgrading all of their Cisco routers to support the uh, new releases. So. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What was the max utilization on the port? Uh, okay, um, our normal traffic we were running at, um, let me make sure I get this right. Primarily, we were in the um, 50 meg range. Trying, we were pushing it pretty hard, even for a 10 100 uh, meg connection for baseline traffic. On the gig side, we we had pushed it well. It varied a little bit. We were we were able to see 900 k or 900 meg. I'm sorry. Um, at some points, depending on the products that we had in place. Uh, of course, you know, we never really exceeded the, the full gig, but uh, that was the attack. The, the 900 meg was the attack. On the normal side, we were in the 250 to 300k, your meg range. So. The, the frame? No, we, well, actually we did. We, um, we went from 64 byte to 1500 MTU. Um, we jumped around a little bit in there. But once, once we nailed the box, it, you broke some aspect of it. 
we did a little more testing, but then we pushed it back to the vendor to try to address the issues. I'm sorry, say it again. We did do randomly spoofed addresses. Um, part of the challenge that we had was within the lab network, creating an environment where the products didn't think the good traffic was all bad tra traffic, because we had to limit the IP ranges we could work in, which generally were you know internal IP addresses, 1010 10, whatever, or 192 dot whatever. Um, the the products really for the the spoofed addresses versus the non spoofed i mean they just they were looking at traffic changes uh, in general and they responded to the change based on uh, whatever that change might have been <laughs> you shut the box off um, now that's a good question. It, there's really limited protection you can do against that, except to deny all for that particular uh, service or port or something of that nature. It was one of the things that we had discussed as a possible solution, the reverse path filtering. Um, we, we never actually got to the point of implementing it, so we're, I don't have a lot of answers on that. It, it, looked, it sounded like a good idea. The actual application of implementing it, I don't have the background for it. So, okay. We need to finish up here. I'm certainly happy to answer any additional questions. Uh, my contact information is on the uh, CD. Uh, it's in the back of the slides. So certainly feel free to email me. Thank you very much, and hope you enjoy the rest of the show.